Uh, next up, we have our Young Persons Perspective panel. Um, so I'd like to introduce these lovely folk here. So uh, T Hogan, who is a filmmaker, Anna Doherty, postgraduate student uh, at the School of History at the University of Leeds. We also have Johnny Price and Caitlin Gorman from Leeds Playhouse, if you'd like to take a seat. to introduce yourselves uh, we'll start uh, with you hiya i'm anna doherty um i am a postgraduate student studying at the university of leeds in the school of history and doing a social and cultural um history degree um i am mainly here i'm not from a specific arts background like my other panelists um i'm here mainly to represent someone who has used the arts to help overcome um their own mental health journey. Um, during my undergraduate degree I um, suffered with anorexia and I sort of used, I was given art and drama therapy and really used sort of the um, sort of culture and art to uh, sort of recover from that as I was using eating as coping mechanism, sort of replaced it with creativity and other aspects. So. Uh, I'm T Hogan, uh, I'm a filmmaker and also a young ambassador for MAP Charity. Uh, my background in the arts is I got kicked out of school at a very young age. Uh, I was bullied quite badly. I uh, had really bad issues with my mental health. Uh, but through MAP Charity, I was able to find my passion for filmmaking uh, and also helping young people explore their creative op uh, options too. Hi, I'm Johnny Price. I'm an actor and a writer. Um, I think that um, most recently I've been involved in... Uh, the Dinner 1855, which was uh, an intergenerational piece at the Leeds Playhouse. Um, and I think it's really interesting um, to get different generations' perspectives on um, the same issue, as I think we can all think that we think the same, but unless we actually have the conversations, we're never quite sure. Um, I'm Caitlin Gorman. Um, I'm a student at Leeds Beckett University. Um, I also do um, some things with the Playhouse. I was um, quite recently um, in a production of Hamlet down at the Pop-Up Theatre. Um, I also am in uh, the Young Company down at um, the Playhouse as well. Um, and I'm here today um, because um, I'm doing all that kind of things with the Playhouse, um, but also because um, I think uh, 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 the arts play such a big role within mental health and for me uh, specifically uh, being uh, having the arts with my mental health was so important in terms of feeling that sense of community um, especially when my mental health was uh, not not uh, uh, great so yeah thanks folks so I would I would love to explore our creative backgrounds um, I know you've mentioned about the hearts being supportive of your mental <coughs> health um, so, what or who inspired you to access the arts in the first place? Anyone can go, whatever you like. Well, I'll go first. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, throughout high school I've always been really into music and fashion as well, but when I get, got to year nine, when I was struggling already with my mental health and it came to my options, I found out that there was actually no way for me to do music or textiles or DT or anything that was creative, any kind of creative output. So um, not to be able to have that something to look forward to and express yourself, I found it really difficult, especially with what I was going through at the time. Um, and after eight different behaviour schools, I was able to find the last one which I went to, which was MAP Charity, which stands for Music and Arts Production. Uh, and they taught me how to produce music, how to make videos, how to paint, how to draw, and all them different types of things really pushed me as a person and found my focus, which was making films. So, and I have to thank uh, Paul Edmead for that because he has really, really helped me. Like, do what I do in my life now, yeah. I think it's, it's probably quite a similar thing with me uh, in terms of, I think school plays a, a huge part in it. Um, so I was quite uh, lucky, I, I was, able to take uh, both music and drama at GCSE um, and I'm not going to deny that they were challenging um, sometimes it's um, interpersonal relationships that are pushed to limits or whether it's just having to in music having to remember a million facts about one piece of Mozart's music <laughs> which is quite difficult but it it's it offers something that um, other subjects just don't um, you're not often sat behind a desk looking at a piece of paper or at the board or listening to a sort of um, a lecture from your teacher. It's much more 
um, much more active, much more you being engaged with the other people in the room as well as with the students uh, and with the teachers. It's just a completely kind of different environment um, to the rest of school, which for me um, is that's really how I learn. I don't really learn behind a desk. I learn up on my feet, um, moving about, making a fool of myself. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I'd sort of, <coughs> well, it's kind of different for me um, in terms of I was always quite creative as well during school. Um, and when I got ill um, a few years ago, I, I think the thing with eating disorders is it makes you very controlled. So I had a very restrictive view of life. I didn't sort of leave my house and it was very like I didn't really engage with my outside community and stuff. So but because I have quite a creative personality and prior to getting ill that's sort of what I really enjoyed doing I always wanted to be a writer when I was younger always making stories up always painting always drawing um and so when I sort of discovered this and sort of talked about this more it was that 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 they used to help me um sort of unleash that kind of part of me so I was able to sort of express how I was feeling in a sort of a different context um and that's kind of what started me off and it sort of inspired me to go on further to do and to sort of help other people as well in terms of exploring different activities, not necessarily engrossing yourself in one specific thing, but actually showing that there's so many things out there which people might not necessarily associate with their well-being that can really benefit them and really um, sort of unleash that part that might be restricting them in sort of their worldview. Um, for me, um, I was quite little actually. Um, I was uh, probably um, year one in primary school. And um, I was never very good academically, um, and uh, was uh, I had a teacher who um, was I was very quiet at school, and she um, kind of persuaded me to uh, audition, sort of, um, for the Christmas production um, for um, Mrs. Claus, and uh, <laughs> I was a little bit apprehensive to do it. Yeah, <laughs> um, and I went and I uh, did it, and I got the part, and I was never. Um, anything special at school, um, but finally I, I was, uh, through this teacher, was, was uh, kind of, she saw something in me and I was, uh, was musically, um, like I was okay at something finally, and um, uh, it, was, it was kind of where I found that I was actually okay at something and someone, someone believing in me was really where I um, found that I had it. And I kind of lost it a bit through, through primary school, I kind of um, was thinking, you know, you can't, you can't do anything with, with music and drama and, mm -hmm. Um, and then found it again a few years later. So, but yeah, it was it was that teacher that kind of did it for me. So. Yeah, I can totally agree. So, f from me personally, hated exams. Absolutely hated them. No, not for me. <coughs> Art and music definitely played a role when I was growing up, and that's what really inspired me. So, I completely agree with the arts in growing up. Um, so what inspired you uh, in accessing the arts? Quite a big question. I know we've spoke about our, um, the people that have inspired us, but to this day, what inspires you now? I guess I can see the pos the just I can only see the positives in it. Um, so um, I'm have uh, having sort of recovered. I I'm like a beaten bastard now for the charity, um, and also um, sort of a well-being rep for the arts, humanities, and cultures in, um, faculty. And I also work at the Leeds University Union as well. And in my job there, it is sort of primarily about putting on a program of well-being events so we do stuff like pom-pom making and uh, painting and plant potting and um, things that you might not necessarily associate with one sort of cultural institute per se but actually those little things and I think I've seen the benefits of not just getting people down and doing an activity that might distract them from their everyday life, but actually connecting a group of people who might be very isolated and just want to come along. And I think, uh, I know we'll go on to this later, but the fact that these things are accessible, I mean, I'm talking from obviously, obviously from a student perspective, these are accessible and they're free to, to get to. Um, personally, I, can't, I, I can only see benefits, beneficial things from it. So for me, it's all about kind of <laughs> continuing to explore different easy ways of engrossing with the arts and not necessarily as well well <coughs> obviously sort of going into these activities are benefiting our well-being but i think people can't see that link per se so i think it's about knowing <coughs> there's a link there and actually knowing that trying to maintain our well-being and 
um, sort of increasing it is a central part of sort of living and going through, especially as a student as well. Um, for me, my like my inspiration is like everyone who has ever helped me or supported me on my journey because it's been a, quite a difficult period of my life, like all the way through growing up. But to see like young people who have gone through the same thing as me, it really pushes me to like show them that I was in your position once, and not not even that long ago, like a few years ago, and now I'm doing what I'm doing. And I never thought that like filmmaking for me would be a career. I thought it could be a hobby at the most. And now I'm making, I've got my own business. I'm running my own business, and to tell the kids like that are only a few years younger than me, listen, I was where you are, and look where I am at now. <coughs> that pushes me to then. Like, I don't know, that inspires me. I want to show the kids that, you know, there's not, it's not one, one size fits all kind of system. There's other ways around it and other ways to do it. Yeah. M mine's the, uh, mine's the same with, um, with kids as well. Um, so I, um, not, a, I'm a member of the, the youth theatre ensemble at the Playhouse, um, but I also volunteer with two of the younger groups as well. Um, and I think watching, um, kids that are so i volunteer with the 11 to 30 uh, no the 14 to 16s and then the next youth theatre production that the leeds playhouse are putting on um so i work with quite a wide variety in that and to see some of them really engage with some of the script that they're given or really engage with um the exercises or just with some of them they just seem to have some sort of complete change of when they walk in at the beginning of term to then even just a couple of weeks in them seeming to find confidence somewhere and I think it's just through the through the kind of the environment that we create um, like in the youth theatre is everything's fine it's great you can do whatever you want if you want to run around in circles go for it we might have to wait for you to stop before we can move on. But if that's what you want to do, why don't we all run in circles? Why don't we all just do this for a little bit? It's fun, it's exciting, and then we find the value in it. So I think it's, yeah, seeing other kids um, finding the real benefits, um, especially with me in drama, yeah. Um, for me, it's um, uh, the specific, when I was a little bit younger, there were certain um, types of... Um, art, uh, whether that be drama or um, anything, that was seemed um, on a pedestal, um, that was only kind of um, uh, for top people. And uh, for me, uh, I, it, it inspires me to be able to find any work or make work or see work, um, but specifically make work that is accessible to everyone. So to have, um, to not have anybody feel that they are not um, allowed to access any type of work and that's that's what inspires me yeah. have all work be accessible great yeah. oh you are lovely mm -hmm. <laughs> okay so um i know we spoke about access to the arts so i'd like to explore that a little bit further so what are your thoughts currently for young people accessing the the arts is there limitations um is there positive highlights that we can talk about who'd like to go first um i'll go first um I guess I think the limit from personal perspective, yeah. I'm sort of talking from a student perspective, and I work. I'm really lucky to work in an environment <coughs> where there is there is increased sort of funding and there is increased attention going into it. So as I mentioned before, like the activities that, for example, the Leeds University Union <coughs> run, they're mainly free, and we've always got a a, a um, program of really exciting events going on. Um, the project that I've been involved in with the Faculty of Arts, Humanities and Cultures is um, it's been in its pilot the year this year and that has put on so many different events which um, just trying to get people and just trying to show people that um, this is beneficial for you. Um, so I guess from my perspective, although others might disagree, I know there are drawbacks, I have only sort of experienced the positives. I'd say one of the biggest sort of drawbacks is the sort of knowledge and the understanding that it is as important as, I'd say, feeding yourself or exercising or talking to people. It's sort of about making sure that, and, and I understand that for a lot of people it might not be the case, but for certain individuals, the arts 
um, and creativity are things that can really, really benefit and having that outlet is really, really important. So I think it's sort of increasing that knowledge and understanding and showing people that we have these things out there. And they're not just, it's not just a case of saying you have to go and take up a new, uh, you have to become a new, uh, take up a new hobby, but it's about trying lots of different things. And also knowing that actually a part of, if we talk about sort of culture, in our community, for example, it's about knowing that there are things on your doorstep. It took me three years to realise that I could open my door and go out and there was Leeds Playhouse or there was the City Museum and there was all this culture around me and actually it was there to benefit me. And I think it's making that link between mental health, well-being, and also the arts. Um, well, I'm kind of coming from a dis different perspective because for me it's been very difficult to even find a foot in the door creatively within any kind of space, if that's music, art, dance, you know, anything. <coughs> yeah, it is on our doorstep. However, a lot of young people do not know how to access that in the first place. I think as like a, like a community together, we really need to be pushing how you like how people get to access these things because I'm lucky, like, even though I got kicked out of school and I went to all these different behaviour schools, that last one I went to, I was able to find what I am passionate about. But that took nine schools and, you know, eight behaviour, no, nine schools in general, two high schools, seven behaviour schools, to then find what I'm passionate about. That We can't have that for every single young person because if that's how it's going to happen, there's going to be no funding, which there isn't anyway. A lot of people that are getting kicked out of school now are not going to a behaviour school that specialises in behavioural issues because I didn't even find out until I was 19, 18, like earlier this year, that I was autistic. And that took, what, 18 years of my life for people to realise that. If I found out that when I was like in primary school or start of high school, my high school would have been completely different because I'd have had the recognition. Not that I'm just different, but there's actually something else there and it's not that I'm different because I actually use that as my uniqueness and I'm really passionate about what I do. Sorry, I get a bit <laughs> shaky about it, but yeah, I'm really, really passionate about what I do. So really, it's about putting funding into young people's education that isn't just, you know, the academic stuff because we cannot be letting the whole of the next generations to come go to so many different schools just to find out what they want to do. It really needs to be open and accessed a lot more by younger people, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I, I would agree with that completely. That's I, yeah, funding, please. Um, <laughs> but then again, not just in, um, not just in schools, because we hear of the the awful cuts to the arts and the fact that GCSE drama and music are not being offered anymore um, in certain <coughs> schools, which is horrendous um and i think depending on what level um of of the arts you want it kind of depends on its accessibility at least from my point of view as a as an actor um so kind of my my next step that i kind of see is getting into drama school which is kind of the actor's equivalent of university it's kind of the highest quality training um that you can get um, as an actor and I've auditioned for two years now um, to get into drama school I've done 15 different auditions um, at, co um, at colleges around um, the country some in Scotland in Wales in Manchester majority in London um, and they they say that they offer bursaries and I think that that's that's great but they offer so few bursaries that um, the majority of people and um, because they, they offer bursaries for the auditions sorry you have to pay for your auditions i know i have I've, i know i've had to pay about 55 pounds per audition and i've done 15. now i've i've worked a lot to make all that money to spend it but that's just on the auditions i've had to travel and train tickets are not cheap at the best of times and sometimes they'll tell you two weeks in advance. Booking train tickets three months in advance, you can get them relatively cheap. Two weeks, you don't stand a chance. Not even a megabus. No, <laughs> no. Um, and then sometimes they may want you for the afternoon, so then you have to get an open return because you don't know if you're going to stay for the afternoon for your recall. And then sometimes they'll want you again the next day. So 
in terms of, yes, it's great they offer bursaries, but they don't think, oh, yeah, someone from Yorkshire is going to have to come down to London for an audition at 9 o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, they can say that we offer this, but it's not good enough. And so I am kind of lucky in the sense that I have um, the funds to support myself for that. But from people from lower income families or those that are not lucky enough to have jobs, it's not accessible. And it's a real shame. It's a real shame. Thank you. Um, I think uh, I've kind of got um, uh, two points on this. I think the first one um, being that there's definitely some amazing things to access. Um, since I've gone to uni, I've found that there's a lot of, inter um, definitely um, with regards to like performance art style things or live art, um, a lot of pay as you feel kind of performances, which are amazing to access if you know how to access them. Um, we have a university group chat, um, and I'm usually the one on there saying, guys, there's a lot of like pay as you feel kind of things to access um, that people know not much about really, um, even like with like my performing arts group chat. So like we should probably know about it, and a lot a lot of my um, like peers don't. Um, where you do. Um, as it kind of says on the tin, you kind of you watch the performance and then pay what you feel. The only problem with those is a lot of like, p even like like I'm guilty of it sometimes. Like it's kind of you put what you want in, so it's like you know you kind of put in like coppers, like so you're not putting in what you should be. But like you know, a five five pound ticket for a, for a performance is is nothing really. Um, so that's an amazing side of like. Uh, what what's going on, especially around Leeds, there's so much of it around Leeds. Um, the only thing, and I kind of second what you guys are saying, um, is that um, I have um, an 11 year old sister who kind of um, is kind of going um, down the same path as me in terms of like academia. So she's not, um, in terms of like maths and science um, and even English, I would say she's not that, um, she's not, She's not very academic, but she's very creative. And the fact that things like GCSE drama is being um, like cut, uh, like and, and things like that, is is really um, worrying because that's where her strengths are. Um, so uh, to think like that's when I uh, like. I used to look forward to like my drama lessons at school and my music lessons at school and to think that like she won't if she like she's not going to have that is really a worry that she's going to have to go to school and think like she's not the clever kid because she's she's got to go and sit in a maths lesson when actually her strengths lie in um, the more creative subjects is, is actually a real worry and, and to think about where her her mental health will lie because of the fact that she won't have access to those more creative subjects is is really worrying yeah. at age 11. Great. We've spoke extensively about the lack of funding and how we've individually and personally had relationships with the arts and the funding and we touched a little bit about how we can actually know about certain things in the areas and I know you mentioned about Facebook chat so I, I wanted to kind of slip into a little conversation about how technology in the digital world has supported our mental health. Would you like to talk about that? Well for a long time especially growing up like like in high school like I hated social media because of like how badly I was bullied like a lot of it was like I was at school I'd come home did texts Facebook God knows what Instagram all that stuff and I was just fed up with it for a long time I just like ghosted you know went off grid I didn't do any like social media because I just I didn't feel like it was helping my mental health in any way however now I've found out that that's one like Instagram is probably one of my biggest platforms for getting um new business uh, new new clients and new like work coming in because a lot of my promotional stuff and a lot of my work is then distributed onto instagram onto facebook onto youtube all these different things so i've been really been able to like flip it on its head and go instead of going oh, i'm going to use this as like a social kind of thing i've used it as like another part of my business platform it's for very people visual as well. yeah like exactly especially video content yeah. And instagram yeah. yeah great i think social media is um a wonderful kind of vehicle um, <laughs> I love that That's and it, c it can be a vehicle for whatever you want um, it can be a vehicle for hatred which is often how people will disregard it and they say oh well it's it's bad for me they're always on their phones they're always scrolling through um, and I think if you if you use it like that and you're on it compulsively and it's kind of the it, it is kind of it is addictive I think we can all accept that it is. Um, we always want to kind of see the next post or get this many likes on whatever we put on and stuff. But I think if you 
kind of take a step back from social media you can kind of like you said you can find the positives in it um and so yeah i i see social media very much as a vehicle now um and if i want certain things then i can find them on there but then if i if i catch myself on it for too much um for, for too long sorry or if i catch myself doing it's you choose how you use social media and you've just got to choose the the right things to support yourself as opposed to tear yourself down yeah i'd agree with that i think um for a long time i definitely think social media was media was incredibly negatively mm. impacting my mental health um not just um other people but i think especially given my own journey um and the like problems I had with body image and um, comparisons to other people I surrounded my uh, so I had to walk through life thinking these thoughts and then look at my phone and see pictures of other people and how my mind was interpreting that was not beneficial or helpful um, and I think one of the first things that I was told to do was just sort of detox my feed and that's sort of what we tell people now when we go and speak to schools um, as part of beat is one of the things is just please just be aware of your so social media. And and <coughs> as I before, it's not a negative thing at all. If you are savvy and if you design your feed to include things which inspire you and things that you would what represent your values. Um, so one of my favourite social media apps is like Pinterest, for example, as opposed to sort of an Instagram. And it's all the visual things where you can see and things that on a daily basis which inspire you, not just sort of, positive sort of mental attitude but also that creative side as well so and so forth it's it, as you said it's a great place for sort of people who are in the arts to spread their work to spread their message um and so i think it can be beneficial um for a long time i sort of wrote blog posts and had my own blog as well which um was sort of my creative outlet but a long time of it I sort of remained unpublished and I think it for me it was a space where I could express myself in my work and not have to worry about the eyes of other people um, so yeah I'd say it can be hugely negative if you're not sh if you are not aware of how to navigate but if you are and if you are savvy about it and you only surround yourself with things which are positive and always question is this is this is this being negative towards my mental health is this doing me any favors and if it's not i think a lot of young people don't realize that you can actually unfollow your friends and like if they're yeah, not you have a choice exactly <laughs> yeah. like so many times i've gone through like actually you're not helping me you're not part of my values and actually i'm not my mental health and my well-being is the most important thing to me over other people like over what other people think of me and i don't i don't care if i'm going to unfollow you and you're going to see that because if you're not benefiting me if you're not um, contributing to my mental health I don't want you part of my life we always have a choice I think mm -hmm. yeah I think that's um, a big thing is being um, uh, having people being educated on how to like uh, for young people have uh, be educated on how to use it um, I think definitely I use it very differently now to how I used it say um, maybe 10 years ago it's a very different yeah. space for me um, but I think one thing I heard recently was that um, these things have uh, like the social like uh, Instagram specifically have people like moderating them now. So um, apparently, if you like um, specific words that you can like search on these sites, yeah. um, and not coming up like uh, uh, how they used to. So um, specific words uh, come up as now very different things. So uh, if young people are um, searching, um, yeah, specific things are not coming up. They're coming up with very different meanings now. So because they're being moderated, which is a really amazing thing um, to, to know. Yeah, I think to take away from a young person's perspective, especially on social media and mental health, it's we always have a choice of how we use it. And I think perhaps there needs to be a bit more education on how we can use it for our positives mm. instead of the negatives. Um, and I guess the, the overall question I'd love to ask you all is um, what are your thoughts overall on young people's mental health today? It's quite a big question. Mm -hmm. Well, I think there's a lot more pressure on young people, uh, especially with expectations of grades and how they need to look and what they need to do and the kind of job they need to get and all these different kind of things. That's so much pressure on one young person to have. And the fact that there's cuts in the creative education system already, that's directly correlating to pe like young people's mental health and how that's going downhill. 
like if you've not got no way to express yourself that it's going to come out in your body like it and that doesn't just happen like you know if someone's stressed to a point where they can't deal with it like emotionally it, it does like affect like their whole body like that has happened to me to the point where like my hair is falling out my skin's got really bad like and that, and that happens and i don't think like young people should have to go through that just because they have so many expectations on top of them so like having more things to create and like express yourself with for young people will really help their mental health and also just for them to know that like the creative arts is not just like painting and music and dance there's so many different things you know what you could be a creative builder if you really wanted to be architects are one of the most amazing people ever and people don't see anything more than like the basics of art art is such a wide spectrum of things you can do you could change anything you wanted to be and make it into some kind of art so i think like when people say like oh we need to push the creative arts and we're only looking at the top level we need to look at the whole level because that's where like m it you know you could have someone who doesn't want to do art or doesn't want to do music but has got so much passion and focus they want to push them into you're excluding them people from like the creative do system do you think there's a little bit of stigma around being a creative like for people that think that the arts isn't for me yeah, yeah definitely because arts is just it's anything you make it you know what i mean it doesn't have to be you have to be an artist you have to be a music producer or a guitarist or a pia pianist you could literally be anything you want to be you want to be and make that your creation and that can be yours then do you know what i mean i think we need to highlight that the arts and culture is it flows through everything and i think and it's one of the biggest um like incomes to the uk itself like over 52 billion pounds go into the creative industry in the uk every year so why is that one of the littlest things we're putting in funding for that makes no sense yeah i guess they're under a lot of strain um it's true there's a lot there's a lot going on right now um both politically economically globally and then you've got the the day-to-day -day things anyway of not arguing with your parents or getting along with your siblings trying to understand social media and technology keeping up with that trying to maintain friendships there's a lot going on and <laughs> i think Put it well it's true <laughs> and so i think as a society we need to accept and um help young people in terms of they they live wildly different lives to how we did when we were younger granted i'm saying this is a, a 20 year old i'm not that old <laughs> but um in terms of we've all even just like 10 years apart someone who's 10 years younger than me will have a vastly different childhood to me and so someone that's 30 will have a vastly different childhood to me as well and so we all have our own struggles as well but we have an obligation to look after the future generations because they're going to be the ones that are about when we're all gone mm -hmm. um i guess i just highlight what you said about expectation um sort of i think that's probably one of the biggest problems it's sort of the amount of expectation we put on so sort of today's young people, um, as I said before, about sort of you've got the mix of academic pressure, you've got the, the pressure of looking a certain way, of doing certain things, of um, if we talk about social media, of posting certain things and appearing in a certain way. And if that's not who you are, if you are living sort of through the lens of somebody else or what you perceive to be what the world wants, what is expecting of you, that is eventually going to go wrong somewhere because you can't you have to live authentically to yourself um and so i guess you are right in saying that like we have to accommodate the fact that every generation is different and like i always thank my like lucky stars that although i grew up with like sort of like the social media pressures and expectations and stuff it wasn't around really until I was in my mid-teens that it really kicked off. If it had been there 10 years younger, you've got like four-year-olds with iPads and, mm -hmm. you know, and it's like, that's great. Technology is fantastic, but it, as we said before, it can also be quite destructive as well. So it's knowing that we've got, it, we live in a world which is bustling with different things and 
I think it's so much to take in. It, we're not in that sort of simple world which might have been we might have just gone out and gone to work and come back and had dinner with our families and just done what what was the sort of the standard existence we're now in a world where there are so many things bustling there's so many as you said before economic challenges political challenges global just everything and i think we have to acknowledge that that's changing and it will continue to change mm. every year that goes by and as it does, we need to start accommodating these different issues, and that includes exploring how we can integrate the arts, integrate culture, and not lose it from sight, per se, not just put more money into it, not just make it better and make it more a part of our existence, but not let it fade away into the background as less important than all these other things that are going on. I completely agree. Um, I think... Um in terms of like, I completely agree with that, and um, I think, I think, there's definitely times where I believe that um, to get talking about um, mental health issues is getting easier, but I do believe there's a lot of stigma still around it, and uh, depending on kind of what's going on, depending on um, maybe if you have a diagnosis, depending on what that diagnosis is, um, it can be harder to talk about. There's a lot of stigma around certain diagnoses, I think, um, still, um, and uh, that can be quite tricky. Um, so. Uh, yeah, I find I have some uh, friends and family who have specific um, diagnosis or symptoms and they find it quite or a little maybe easier to talk about or more vocal about it. And then um, other friends and family who have other ones who find it a little bit more challenging. I think just that's literally the stigma around that specific um, thing they have. Um, but um, yeah, uh, I think one thing I will say is um, m uh, in terms of like how... Um, I struggle, and then again, my little sister, who's 11, who I keep talking about, but um, I was having a conversation with her recently, and I started getting quite, um, like, a little bit wound up, and uh, I was saying, like, I can't, like you, you're being a bit ridiculous, like, this is, like, quite insane, and I went away from the conversation, and she was quite upset, and I was quite upset, and um, I, s like, thought about it, and I thought, um, she's very upset, and she's 11, and I'm 24, and, <laughs> like, we're both probably quite upset, and to me, her problems were nothing. Like, they were nothing. But to her, they were the world. And uh, so even though, like, to me, they were ridiculous and I had uh, essays due and, 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 like, to me, like, th that was my world. And probably to my mum and dad, my, my issues were nothing. To her, to Martha, the little fight she'd had at school was her world. So that was really, like, overtaking everything that, that was going on in her life. So um, I think, like, to... to no matter what what's going on with 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 kids that are, or young people that are like younger than us, even though my sister's a lot younger than me, um, to kind of make sure that we're like she's important is um, even if it's nothing, and even if it took up an hour of my time when I had a lot of words due the next day, <laughs> um, was w was what was important. So even if uh, my sister's mental health sometimes isn't great, um, it's it's just I think to be heard even if that's, you know, if that's what's important. To be heard. Yeah, yeah yes. to be heard. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, if we could summarise, I guess, how we could, how, in the, what would you like to see in the future for the arts and for mental health and for young people? Well, I'm a massive, like, advocate for the underdogs and anyone who's not seen as, you know, doing what they're supposed to be doing or people that are misunderstood because, for me, Actually, they're the people that are pushing the creative industry more than you'll ever know. I mean, there's so many people that I know who have come from, like, horrendous backgrounds, you know, low-income families, like, all of the stuff that, like, a lot of people don't actually speak about. And they're the people that are going on to do some big things. And I don't think a lot of people see that, because obviously when they've got to that point, you've already, they've not got to see the massive work they've put in to get to where they are now. Because there's a lot of people I meet who will just think, oh, yeah, it's T. That's it, she's a filmmaker. Well, actually, you know what I mean? I'm 18. I've, <laughs> I've had to go through a lot, you know what I mean? I went through a lot in my mental health, like, when I was younger with mental health, like, in and out of hospital a lot. Like, and I know a lot of young people who have gone through the same thing. So, really, instead of excluding them and pushing them to the side, they're the people we should be, like, cheering on on the sidelines because, in reality, yeah, I wouldn't be able to do what I'm doing today if the people that weren't pushing me weren't doing what they were doing. So, yeah, put, put like, 
just giving people opportunities that may not seem like they have the potential of someone who is amazing at maths or someone who's amazing mm. at English or science. You know, they're the people that are like trying to find what they're like, what they want to push themselves at. And usually that is a creative subject, regardless what that is. So I really think we should be looking into the people who are not celebrated instead of the people, you know, if you do like, if you're already doing all right at school, carry on doing what you're doing. I'm not regard like disregarding that. What I'm saying is the people who are not doing well at school are the people who are, you know, don't feel like they fit in. What does fit in even mean? Because for me, I don't care that I don't fit in. I'm glad that I don't fit in because I'm doing my own thing. And you know, I mean, I'm actually doing an all right job at it. So, and I've got like, I'm just saying this because I'm. I'm going to tell you all because I'm really proud of myself. I've only got maths and English, and that was in my second year of college I got that. I've got no other qualifications, and I found out on Tuesday that I've gone, I've gone unconditional to go to university to do visual That's communications. <laughs> so i just like anyone, and also tell whoever you know, like you don't need the grades to do what you want to do because I've just done it with my passion, and that's it. So, yeah. That's amazing. I think we'll end on that, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> that was amazing. <laughs>
things and and didn't really acknowledge per se that mental health was something we all had um and so i think that all the sort of all the sort of steps that are trying to be taken to get it into um, primary schools and the literature that's being produced and the ways of communicating this message to young people are really fantastic um even through sort of i'd say yeah or to you see like um children's books being written around the subjects and also helping people deal with different things like grief um and sort of anxiety and knowing that, and using different creative methods and knowing that it's not necessarily something which is for the few and far between but actually it's something that could affect anybody and acknowledging that actually if this happens to you it's okay and there are things to support you and you're not unusual and you're not strange and actually this is just a part of life and you can recover from these sort of things so yeah thank you any further questions yeah i want to ask a question um you said uh, that you know again um internet can be positive and negative for people Gaming, is there anything positive about it? Because I've got a son and he's always into gaming. I'll answer that question Go because yeah. I don't, I'm not a gamer myself, but I'm sure he won't mind. But I'll speak on behalf of my boyfriend who <laughs> <laughs> is. Um, my, again, I, you probably won't mind me saying this, but he struggled in the past with his, when he was in a teenager, with anxiety issues. Um, and... I met him when he came to university. It sort of changed his life. It was all the freedom that he needed. It was fantastic. And he is, he likes gaming. And I always sort of tease him about it because this is the sort of stereotype you always say, spend all your time on there. But I think we've had a conversation in the past. And he said for him, when he was struggling, when he was 16, 15, 16, it really is not nice stuff at all. Gaming, going into a different world was something that massively, massively benefited him. Mm. He was able to, it was, um, it doesn't really. It wasn't like necessarily like violent games, which are obviously associated with sort of people say, "Oh, they're negative. They're encouraging violent mm -hmm. behaviours and stuff like that." But sort of li life stimulation, and I mean, I think there was a study published about The Sims, the game, a few <laughs> months ago, about how beneficial that can be, about actually engrossing yourself in something different and distracting yourself for even if it's like several hours of the day. So. Although you can say it's not necessarily beneficial, it can actually work as a massive coping mechanism. And for stuff like the life simulation games and the creative gaming, gaming for example, that is like a, that's, that's another way of thinking. Actually, creative arts and culture is not necessarily just about the top level, as you were saying earlier on. That I'd say that was definitely a part of it. And I'd say that although it can have its drawbacks, I I can see with my boyfriend, it's clearly a positive, mm. really positive. My brother as well, just that my brother has quite severe um, obsessive compulsive disorder and for him to be engro like engrossed in a game um, uh, would switch off the um, obsessions and the compulsions just to be engrossed in, in whatever game he was playing. So just that. I am a gamer. <laughs> yeah. I've, I've probably played... I, I'm probably verging on gaming addiction, um, <laughs> which is kind of embarrassing. Um, but I think, well, I, I don't know if it is actually, but I think there are some bad things about playing games too much. I completely agree with that. If um, playing games is taking away from what you should be doing, if you're meant to be doing your homework and you're playing Call of Duty, you're doing it wrong. Mm -hmm. But I think that for me personally, I've made a lot of what I call friends online. My mum is somewhat doubtful as to whether they are my friends <laughs> because I think it is quite hard to justify calling someone a friend who you've never met but do you need to meet someone to be their friend because we me and I was playing with him last night me and my friend um, he's called Paul um, I've never met him lives somewhere in the south can't remember where um, but we're really good mates and I think it's kind of the almost Sometimes face-to-face -face interaction is quite difficult for people, um, and so being able to almost hide behind a screen, but then still be able to communicate with complete strangers does sound quite daunting, but I think a lot of people are just there to have a good time, and games can be fun. Um, again, but not too much, of course not. Yeah. Thank you, uh, panellists. I think we're out of questions, I believe. Is that okay? Anyone? No? Okay, lovely. Thank you so much, everyone. I'll give them a round of applause.
warmly welcome uh, performance maker and artist Ellie Harrison as she performs the Grief series. Wherever she is. Okay, yeah, like yeah, lovely, lovely, wonderful. Give her a round of applause, everybody. Thank you. <laughs> I'm Ellie, that's me. I'm a mental health carer for three members of my family. I'm an orphan. I'm not sure you're allowed to call yourself an orphan when you're 35, but I'm doing it anyway. I'm a performer. I'm an artist. I'm a teacher of young people. I'm a lecturer. I dress like the Queen, but I've had days where I can't afford to eat. <laughs> My job doesn't fit neatly into boxes, and neither do the people I work with. My arts practice and my teaching means I encounter people in transition states. So between childhood and adulthood, between caring responsibilities and the freedom that comes with bereavement, between the binary understanding of gender that adults have taught them they have to pick from. But how do we recognise and celebrate the power of these kind of in-between states? How do we make models of support that are porous and can facilitate growth at key points of change? Um, I'm going to get a bit personal now, but it's OK because I brought biscuits. <laughs> so, just to take the edge off. Uh, now, like arts funding, or compassion in the Tory party, there's not quite enough to go around. <laughs> so um, you're going to have to like share or fight it out. But I'm just going to say to the independents, take biscuits first before the salary guys get their hands. <laughs> 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 Can you grab that biscuit chip, love, and just hand it round? <laughs> Great, I've taken one for myself as well. <sighs> so, yeah, do, 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 go. Uh, my youth theatre had a cut-off at 16 years old. I was now 16, no longer a youth. My newfound status became particularly apparent to me as over the next three years, I lost my single mum, organised and went to my first funeral, became a mental health carer for my family, did exams, got pregnant, had an abortion, moved away from home, lost my brother, auditioned for drama school, uh, and went from not really having been north of Stratford-upon-Avon to living in Wakefield. <laughs> um, so I suppose by the time Freshers' Week came around, you know, I'd hit quite a few milestones. And even once I was studying, I was still in a time of rapid change. So, like, I had to sell my mum's house, which made me effectively homeless during holidays. So I was sleeping on friends' couches and doing a range of colourful jobs. I say colourful to be diplomatic, really. Um, now, I'm aware that this period of my life reads a little bit like a shit Dickens novel. I'm aware of that. Um, <laughs> but having spent the last 15 years teaching people from five years old right up to PhD level, I mean, I think... People from 16 to 25 usually encounter a lot of change. Like, change is the common factor. It's not an anomaly. People find themselves at this huge roundabout with choices about gender, sexuality, career goals, and starting a family, often in flux, seemingly being shouted at to, like, pick a lane and stay in it. Um, and I suppose the thing that, that kind of strikes me it's like, where are the spaces of ambiguity? Where are the spaces where failure is allowed? Where are the places where you can try a new version of yourself, experiment with what leadership feels like, have autonomy, but with someone there to cheerlead you when you lose confidence? For me, the answer was theatre, because, thank God, as well as the youth theatre that kicked me out at 16, I was part of another youth theatre, and they let me stay on when my mum died, and teach to cover my themes, which was really good. And what this group did for me, as well as not rejecting me on the basis of uh, a birthday, was they made me feel seen and heard. Uh, they bared witness to my experience without trying to change them. 
It allowed me to articulate and give voice to the difficult feelings I was feeling or put my worries down and immerse myself in playing at being someone else. And I think the key here is choice. Uh, trusting young people to make decisions and problem solve for themselves. And it was like you were saying, you know, there's lots of, there's not one way of doing it. There's lots of like ways around that. Um, yeah. And I think, yeah, having a space where you can kind of take agency, but with someone kind of compassionately keeping an eye out, really. Um, I went from leading a drama game with the younger students to leading a class and from teaching drama to children to lecturing at universities. And now what I do is I lead teams of international artists, producers, participants, young people. And like I wouldn't have been able to do that without the extracurricular arts giving me that freedom to experiment with leadership, really, and have a go. Because it was a skill that I wasn't able to acquire through mainstream education. Uh, and certainly not through like clinical therapy or at home. So I suppose it's not really a surprise that now I create spaces for people to be creative, to fail and to try something new. Uh, and spaces that understand that just because I'm the facilitator, that in no way means that I am always the expert. So uh, I was mentoring a trans student uh, and their ability to try on different roles for size was really key in helping them identify what felt authentic, what roles felt like a tight fit that pinched and made them feel self-conscious. Uh, I taught a, a group of students basically over a 12 year period um, and that's a kind of consistency and a continuity that they weren't getting at school because they were having a new form teacher every year and they weren't always getting at home you know with parents partners coming and going. So you know, have that, that was a privilege for me to have that 12 years of seeing this group go from six to, you know, leaving for uni. Um, yeah, so I've printed my talk slightly too small, so I'm struggling to see it like an absolute hero. Uh, <laughs> so I suppose what I saw over these 12 years was these students finding their identity, and in particular this trans student, finding their identity role by role. So they stopped requesting overtly female roles. Then they gravitated towards roles with ambiguous gender identities, so like the Lion and the Wizard of Oz. And then they experimented with playing male roles. When the roles they felt comfortable with didn't exist, we wrote them ourselves or we adapted them. So that by the time they tried to articulate to their parents they were trans, we'd already negotiated that territory a hundred times with lots of success. And um, yeah, it was, it was playing, but it was serious because it expanded their notion of what they could be and what they could be celebrated for as well. <laughs> So my designer always says, take your pleasures seriously, uh, which I think is a, a lovely mantra for making art. But I think it's also actually <coughs> quite a good mantra for growing as a person and being psychologically resilient, I think. Um, yeah, and, and, and I suppose what this student also taught me is that, you know, it's the students that teach teachers. When it came to supporting a gender non-conforming student, my boss was a couple of decades behind me, and it was the students that were at the very front of that. You know, in a similar way, young people are protesting climate change, and the President of the United States thinks it's made up. <coughs> uh, another student uh, was with me in a youth theatre session when they learned that a car full of their friends had been killed in an accident over in Morley. You know, this is like a really traumatic event at any age, but particularly when this was their first experience of bereavement. And I suppose while these spaces can't protect young people from experiencing grief, confusion, anger, sadness, it can offer tools for expressing them and articulating them. And it can reassure them that emotions are a natural reaction <coughs> to different circumstances. And actually it's about how we process them that counts. You know, this student said to me, oh, I'm so glad that I'm here because people won't think less of me if I cry and it's not like that in school. 
so as a young person, these kind of like third spaces, these spaces that aren't school and aren't home, they were much more therapeutic for me than clinical therapy. And I think I would hopefully apply that to my students too. Um, but And I suppose it also, you know, as, as you were saying, it's a much broader sense of, of what is creativity. It's not just drama, dance. It, it's all that kind of, there's game design in there. There's, there's a whole load of other things. Um, but what are the environmental factors that make these spaces valuable? For me, there's continuity. So from childhood through to adulthood. So by the time people reach these crossroads when they hit 16, 17, 18 and have to make decisions, they've got trusted friends and adults that have been with them on the whole journey. Um, and these people don't disappear unexpectedly when this person hits an arbitrary birthday. This continuity is an anchor when everything else is turbulent. Um, the stated outcomes are ambiguous. I think ambiguity is like really, really important. Um, because it allows participants to define their own version of success. So one person's success is going to look totally different to somebody else's. Um, there is a time and space to try, fail, massive fan of failure, uh, and try again. That's often not possible in mainstream schools with the current government emphasis on exams and rigid assessments and a certain type of success. I mean, I always uh, tell the students, I, I have basically no GCSEs. Uh, I just have a first class degree and a, and a master's. But I tell them, you know, like, if you do well in your exams, great, but they don't measure your empathy. They don't measure your patience. <laughs> they don't measure your perseverance often. Um, yeah. So having space to fail is, for me, really key to that. They can have a sense of agency at whatever level feels comfortable, whether that's singing in public for the first time, teaching younger students, or trying out a new version of themselves. They might not have agency in school or work or environment, but they can take these skills that they've developed in this third space and they can apply it to the rest of their lives. And a community that bears witness, a community that notices when you're not there, you know, so if you don't turn up one week, people are like, oh, you're right, what's happened? Um, and I think, you know, really, these guys did such a good job that everything I'm saying is, <laughs> is kind of reiterating that. But um, having this third space that's not work, not home, has continuity, ambiguity, a space where you're allowed to fail, and a place where you can take agency amongst a community that has the potential to kind of like radically improve young people's lives and mental health. Um, and I think it's been really interesting for me hearing what you were saying um, about, about kind of like hard data, really, because f a lot of the stuff that I do, I kind of think it's preventative, which actually makes it quite m difficult to measure the impact because you're effectively measuring absence, the absence of problems. <laughs> um, but it's really vital. And I think there's a big kind of misconception that arts activity is fluffy or it's kind of like a, it's a luxury. But let me tell you, there is nothing, nothing fluffy about compassion in action. There is nothing fluffy about holding space for somebody else's anger or sadness or distress. Um, yeah, and yet arts budgets are cut and they're only made available to the rich kids you know, not kids like 16-year-old me <laughs> and not kids like the kids that I work with kind of on a weekly basis. Having activities and services that bridge that gap between childhood and adulthood might be the only continuity that young person has at a time when they're potentially leaving school or leaving home or having lots of new beginnings. So I think, I think that, that teenage period is really important and there aren't enough services that address that gap. There's sort of children's services, adult services, if you're in the middle, good luck. Um, I think another key factor to its success is having really experienced facilitators from a range of backgrounds with a range of different lived experiences. I think the phrase, if you can't see it, you can't be it, feels very, very true to me. Um, so I, I do best and worst of the week with my groups, <laughs> uh, and I always participate too. <coughs> And I had a child who was seven 
And they went, the worst of my week is that my mum died on my birthday. And the best of my week is my brother was so upset that I got to eat his share of the birthday cake. It's great. <laughs> um, and the fact that she had a space to share with humour as well as with sadness was really important. And then when Mother's Day came around, I kind of went, oh, I always feel a bit sad when it comes around to Mother's Day. And she said that was a real comfort to her. So having facilitators that have a range of lived experiences is, is really important. Um, you know, having queer and gender non-conforming teachers can be really reassuring to young people who might be experiencing homophobia at home. We need diverse teachers, and that means paying them properly. Because otherwise, you're just gonna, the teaching pool is just going to be made up of rich kids that had support to become artists, not the resilient ones that didn't. So I feel really hopeful, yeah, so I'm so nearly there, don't worry, love. Uh, <laughs> I feel really hopeful about um, this conference today, about social prescribing, uh, and I hope it connects people to the diverse networks of wonderful artists I know that are working right across the city, rather than skim it over the top of our heads. Because Leeds is full of amazing grassroots arts practitioners, but I'm worried we're invisible to the big arts organisations that they just sort of navigate round us or over the top of us. Um, so please, if you're part of an organisation, come and find us, artists, independent artists. One of them is standing right here. It's so easy. Um, because we are working at grassroots level. We're already doing it. But with more joined up, <coughs> we could be doing more of it for more people and in a more ongoing way. We could be providing more spaces for bereaved people to get together for young people to have continuity when everything else is in flux. We're a diverse bunch with eclectic dress senses, uh, but we can connect to a wide range of people. I think we have the potential to reduce GPs' workload and we can bring communities together because the times when young people grow the most is in these in-between states. The times where they could slip through the cracks, but they don't because there is a space of possibility held open for them by independent artists. So let's turn uh, these pinch points into something to be celebrated, a space where anything is possible and it's all allowed. I hope you enjoy your pity party biscuits. Thank you.